so um, welcome to the second day. Today we're going to look at diagnostic um, imaging, again focusing um, on um, exotic pets in the first instance, but we'll also have some, some images of, uh, of other species as well. Um, principally focusing on radiography and um, ultrasound, but uh, there'll be a little bit uh, on CT and MRI uh, as well. Um, but uh, yeah, principally focusing on um, radiography and uh, ultrasound. So we'll look at small mammal uh, radiography in the first instance. Um, first of all, obviously, um, we need to be aware that ideally positioning, as with anything to do with diagnostic imaging, is all important. And interpretation of radiographs is incredibly difficult with uh, potentially incorrect positioning. Um, and so chemical restraint really is, is, is preferred um, in the majority of cases. You may be able, for certain diagnostic purposes, such as to uh, prove gravidity or something like that in an animal, to get away with poor positioning, and therefore maybe uh, physical restraint or um, uh, just uh, uh, trusting on the animal not to move while you take the radiograph, in the case of some reptiles. Uh, but otherwise, we're looking at uh, ideally uh, wanting uh, to immobilize them. Um, positioning wise, obviously, again, standard two views at 90 degrees to each other, but clearly there are a whole bunch of skyline views that we can also look at as well, um, which may be of use. Um, so typically with your bunny, uh, if we're looking at this, then we're looking at um, uh, DV or VD views, lateral recumbencies. We may want to take two laterals, so it is worth, if you're at all unsure, uh, repeating um, not only a right but also a left lateral view, uh, and sometimes that does give you uh, the world of difference in your image and can make uh, it very uh, uh, useful. Uh, but also when we're talking about oblique views, particularly when we're talking about things like dental disease, uh, where we want to throw one uh, jaw uh, line away from another, um, and uh, we potentially want to use things like bisecting angle radiographs in some species um, to look at dental roots, um, and we'll, we'll look at those in a, in a little while. Equipment-wise, for most of the small mammals, 40 to 60, 70, sorry, kilovolts, 0.08 to 0.016 seconds for most small mammals um, is typically um, the minimum that you need. Most um, small head machines will go up to 90 or 100 kilovolts. Um, uh, dental machines are really useful if we're talking about rodents and uh, small birds and so on, um, because we can use non-screen film, we can use a very focal, um, short distance uh, image, um, which can give us magnification. Cassette-wise, uh, obviously the majority now are digital, um, and uh, we can use DR systems, obviously, and, and CR systems. I'm not going to go into any great detail about how these things work, because there's not much uh, point in this. Um, but suffice to say that mammography and dental film is still used, um, and you can get self-developing film uh, to work with dental machines, and can still be really useful and give you a high level um, of detail um, for some of the very small animals. But Certainly, obviously, digital systems. I take it everybody's working with digital now. Nobody's using wet chemistry. No, you're still using wet chemistry. Yeah, okay. I mean, there are still a few out there. Um, they're fine. They're a lot better than they used to be. We used to, I can sufficiently old enough to remember still working with the manual developing systems um, as recently as 2009. Um, so um, <clears throat> certainly in the zoo that I was in. Um, but however, um, these things steadily improve and the images improve. Unfortunately, the problems also improve because you can overinterpret some of these images as well. So some of these images are plain um, film, traditional, and some of these images will be digital. Um, this is to give you uh, a typical uh, view of, um, uh, I will say, normal rabbits. Some of it's normal, and some of it's not normal. It's normal that a lot of rabbits have uh, these issues. So lateral um, and ventrodorsal in this particular uh, instance. Um, and again, apologies for teaching granny to suck eggs, but we can show you um, some uh, typical features. Um, in fat bunnies, you can see the kidney shadows, usually pretty 
uh, easily. The stomach should always have food in it. This one actually has a quite a significant gas crescent and is somewhat distended. This particular bunny does have a little bit of ileus. We can see that the actual stomach um, is projecting beyond the caudal border uh, of the rib cage on this one. This is perhaps a more normal stomach uh, where the the stomach is kept behind the caudal border of the rib cage. You can see the liver is very much a flattened uh, organ in the case of the rabbit, completely uh, underneath the, uh, the rib cage, except on the ventral aspect. You can see the two crura, the diaphragm. We can also see the chest. This is positioning is not ideal here. We really would like to get this limb pulled more cranially because it is obscuring um, the ventral aspect of the lung field there. It's rare that we can actually see a great deal of detail cranial to the heart uh, because the heart uh, and mediastinal uh, uh, tissue in that area, which is largely thymus, and thymus persists into adulthood um, in rabbits and most rodents. Um, will fill that area. So we're really, when we're looking at lung fields, we're looking more uh, at um, a caudal lung fields uh, for evidence of pneumonia or metastases or other signs of disease. But you can see the chest is relatively small in comparison to the overall body size. Um, these hindgut fermenters clearly have um, significantly developed uh, digestive tracts uh, and the abdomen is, is, is large in comparison. Um, the cecum sits uh, obviously on the, uh, the floor predominantly um, and we can usually see homogeneous um, uh, faecal material in there um, and small pockets um, of uh, gas within it. Urinary bladders in rabbits frequently have this silt in it, so this is uh, usually calcium carbonate, occasionally calcium oxalate uh, within it, um, and this is often viewed as a normal finding. Uh, as I'm sure you're aware, rabbits, like a lot of um, herbivores that rely largely on grass, have no ability to down-regulate the amount of calcium they're absorbing from the digestive system. So if on a, uh, a calcium-rich diet, they will have to excrete it in their urine, uh, and this frequently shows up uh, as radio dense areas in the urinary bladder. Um, the lumbar spine, uh, thoracic spine, these are, uh, are typical areas obviously for um, uh, quite advanced spondylosis in a lot of rabbits. This one's actually not that bad. Uh, we've really not got uh, any significant mineralization um, of uh, discs and no bridging uh, between the vertebral bodies. But we'll see some later on that can be quite significant from quite an early age. What we can see in this bunny though is we've got quite significant osteoarthritis, um, particularly in this knee here, um, with osteophytes um, around um, the uh, knee joint. And rabbits have got a hyperflex knee, so it is you know bent back on itself. Um, uh, caudal cruciate rupture is common in, in bunnies and stifle arthritis is also common and one of the, the many reasons why rabbits uh, can become increasingly immobile with age uh, and lead to things like urine scalding, uh, faecal soiling and so on. Obviously spinal arthritis is another reason for that um, and in some cases less commonly hip arthritis although hip arthritis in rabbits is, is not so common but yes you can see um, osteophytes um, loss of um, uh, articular space in this particular uh, joint in here, uh, which almost certainly signifies that we've got some cartilage damage. We've probably had a caudal cruciate rupture in that area, uh, rather than cranial cruciate, which were more typically associated in uh, uh, dogs and to a lesser extent cats. Um, and uh, this is just really common in bunnies, more normal knee joints on this particular bunny over this side here. Um, Hypercurved spine, again typical, I mean you can obviously under anaesthesia straighten that out a little bit but there's only so much that you can straighten and obviously the, the form of the bunny at rest um, reaches a point. So this is a good area to look at uh, for spinal fractures and collapsed vertebra. The other area that typically we see spinal fractures is down at the uh, lumbrosacral area uh, which is usually associated with bunnies that have been held inappropriately by the front end and are then kicked out with the back legs and that usually results in dislocations, subluxations and fractures in this area. Um, but the thoracolumbar area is typically when a rabbit um, that is maybe uh, slightly poorly mineralized in its bones, so often house bunnies, things that are not maybe on appropriate diets, they're on muesli type diets, um, and they suddenly bolt, um, they're allowed some freedom and they bolt and run off and if they then twist, 
then it's often in this sort of area up here that we end up with injuries uh, or if uh, owners inadvertently uh, drop them or they drop off a height uh, onto a floor. Um, so normal radiographs more or less for bunnies. Um, abnormal radiographs uh, anybody spot the problems with this one? It's not the world's greatest radiograph. This is a, a wet chemistry system radiograph, but it's got some densities in the lungs. yes, it's got some densities in the lungs. Okay. Dum, 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 dum. <coughs> Anything else that you notice abnormal? Quite yeah, the abdomen's quite distended, isn't it? So we've got the cecum on the floor here, so we can see the gas pockets and the um, ingester in there. Stomach's got quite a bit of gas in it at the top here. It's not particularly distended. We can see a nice left kidney here, right kidney here, liver shadow in here. What's going on in here? There's something vaguely in there. So this is starting to show you the sort of limits of radiography. There's some soft tissue filling mass in here. We've got a distended abdomen. The cecum is down on the floor where it should be. Cecum is not gas distended, so it's not the cecum that's distending it. Stomach is not particularly distended, so that's not doing it. But we've got something in here which is not giving us a lot of gas shadow, so it's probably not digestive tract. Yeah, this is a dough entire. These are cannonball metastases. This is almost certainly a uterine adenocarcinoma. I mean, it could be a pyometra or something of that nature um, without these, uh, these uh, cannonball uh, lumps in the lungs. But typically, this is what we see uh, with metastatic disease associated with uterine adenocarcinomas in bunnies. Um, we're seeing perhaps a little bit of lipping in the uh, vertebra here, uh, but nothing particularly serious in the way of osteoarthritis um, and otherwise um, relatively uh, normal. So this is a, um, a uh, female rabbit that presented uh, with dental disease uh, and this was a referral uh, for dental disease and we can see uh, that we've actually got a little bit of um, fluffy increased density here and we've got a radiolucency associated with the draining uh, abscess and sinus tract uh, associated with uh, infection between premolar 1 and 2 in the lower jaw. Um, but actually on presentation, it also presented with bilateral exophthalmus. Go on. Are you done, you Richard Saunders? Is it venous return of short sort of binomial of interest? Yeah, it is. So bilateral exophthalmus in rabbits, we mentioned it under anaesthesia, is a bad sign. Okay, it's increased vagal tone. There's almost certainly going to be a heart block associated with it. Um, in a conscious bunny, it is typically associated, bilateral exophthalmus with these protruding third eyelids, uh, with um, a uh, precranial mediastinal mass. Okay, so something in that area. It doesn't have to be a thymoma. This one happens to be a thymoma. We cannot make that diagnosis purely on a radiograph. We would have to ultrasound that um, and potentially fine needle aspirate it. Um, but um, Ultimately, this particular individual is showing all the clinical signs of a cranial mediastinal mass. We can see that the trachea has been pushed right up against the backbone here. Um, the, you can see the caudal heart shadow. It looks very upright in comparison with that previous one where it was more horizontal. So we could be dealing with cardiomegaly. I mean, it's very difficult to tell on this particular image. So we could be dealing with a dilated cardiomyopathy. Uh, that doesn't appear to be too much in the way of pulmonary edema associated with that. But there's definitely something filling in that area. So this is really telling us, yeah, okay, we need to use another modality of imaging here to try and assess what's going on. But what we can say is from the clinical sign that there is something in there. From the radiograph, there's definitely something in there. That needs investigating. And whilst it's got dental disease, actually, do you know what? It's amazing this rabbit wasn't showing any clinical other clinical signs. And again, typically with high vagal tone, this rabbit, as soon as you upset it, you know, you poked it, you examined it, you did anything with it, the eyes went back into the sockets again. You let it go and you just let it sit there quietly on the table and it relaxed a little bit and then the eyes came back out again. So again, ablated, typical autonomic nervous system, high vagal tone. Uh, it's also a little bit on the plump side. Um, it's got quite a lot of ingester infill uh, in there, but uh, otherwise um, relatively normal. Um, so some abnormal findings in bunny abdomens. This is quite a small image that seems to have been on here. Sorry, I'd sent these through the other day and this was slightly larger in the, um, 
in the uh, previous image. But we can see very obviously on this one, we've got a um, urolith, um, which is unusual to be fair in bunnies. We normally typically get the silts. Uroliths are often associated, however, with previous cystitis, uh, bacterial nidus, and then forming a urolith around it. But we can also see um, that there are some other areas of um, stone. So we've got the right kidney up here, left kidney in here. We've got a stone in the ureter here. Um, and we've got some stones in um, the, the kidneys here. These ones are often fairly translucent and difficult to pick up um, on radiographs. So you sometimes have to um, fiddle around with the settings if you're using digital radiography um, in order to pick some of these up. But typically uh, with um, uh, renal lifts, um, if there's one in one kidney, there's almost certainly one in the other kidney. It's rare that you get just unilateral uh, kidney affected. If you've certainly got a urolith in the urinary bladder, there's a high risk that you probably will have kidney stones as well. These are incredibly difficult um, to manage. This particular one at the top here, uh, which is a bit on the small side, but you can see um, this particular large viscous down here. What's, what's this likely to be? Cecum, absolutely. So we can see um, the, the, the house tree, so we can see the actual chambers um, of the cecum, these pockets, and they're just full of gas. So this is typical when you get clostridiosis um, or severe enteric disease associated with things like E. coli or salmonellosis. Um, so we've got a lot of gas production, but clostridiosis is one of those that typically, so we've got a tympanic rabbit, it shows up really well on radiography. There's no, very little ingester in there. Uh, we've actually got gas in the small intestine as well, to be honest with you, and gas in the stomach uh, also. Um, so, but uh, yes, when you see that particular house-strated organ, almost certainly going to be cecum and possibly proximal colon, which are the, the main house-strated organs in, in bunnies. Here are perhaps some slightly clearer images uh, of um, kidney stones, a really significant um, hyla um, a deposit in this uh, left kidney here. The right kidney is somewhat obscured by the gas pocket uh, of the stomach, but you can get just the image that there is a stone there. And again, left kidney, really obvious stone, but you can just see there's a stone there in the right kidney as well. We've also got a lot of calcium silt uh, going on in the urinary bl bladder. So we can get kidney stones with infection. We can get kidney stones that cause infection and are associated with high calcium, high vitamin D diets. So this one is more typically associated with a persistent high calcium diet. Um, these again, as I say, are incredibly difficult to treat and often incredibly painful for the bunny uh, as well. Uh, and as we spoke about yesterday, typically uh, uh, we want to try and avoid non-steroidal drugs um, in these cases for obvious reasons. And this bunny is, is particularly aerophagic and has taken in quite a lot of gas uh, into the stomach. You can see the actual stomach lining wall there um, and the liver uh, quite nicely uh, highlighted, but quite a decent uh, uh, fill of ingester there. So this is more uh, discomfort associated. Um, this is, um, in both of these cases here, we've got two different conditions associated with the stomach. So we can begin to see that this one looks particularly dystrophic and looks particularly unusual, but we obviously have a circular viscous here. Um, and we've got the liver, instead of now being sitting down here, seems to have been pushed in this direction. We appear to have something underneath here, which is actually part of the, of the cecum that's been squashed up against. And we've got gassy um, intestines up the top here, which are small intestines that have been pushed in here. So this is a stomach in this particular rabbit, and this is actually a gastric dilatation and volvulus. We do see this from time to time in uh, small mammals. It's been reported in guinea pigs particularly, um, but we see it occasionally in rabbits. This is the precursor to this. This is just gastric dilatation. We've actually got cecal dilatation or gas in the cecum over here, but we've got a significant amount of gas and an empty looking stomach. And that is really abnormal in a bunny. So there should be ingester in the stomach all the time. Um, and that is normal. Um, lack of ingester in there, we can see that the liver very nicely outlined in this particular case, um, is really abnormal. And we've got, this is a, a, a clostridiosis case um, in this particular individual. Um, this particular one, the cause was not really uh, fully identified, but had gone to a full twist. These carry a, a particularly grave prognosis uh, as these bunnies usually go into shock very, very quickly. Um, 
And then we spoke about dental disease. There are a number of different, um, uh, obviously, dental issues. We're taking an oblique uh, view in this particular case so that we can throw the different arcades away from each other. And we may need to take both, obviously, a right and a left oblique in order to get that jawline. But we've got a particularly nice, clean jawline in this particular case. No lumps or bumps, no evidence um, of uh, lucencies uh, in that underlying jaw. Um, the dorsoventral view, however, there is something abnormal because obviously there's a reason why we're radiographing this particular bunny. Um, what, what could you see in the head of this bunny uh, on that dorsoventral view that, that is abnormal? Buller, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we've got issues going on with the tympanic bully, and you're quite right, the right tympanic bulla here, you get the impression that there's increased radiolucency in there. There is increased sclerosis. This is the horizontal canal at this point here this point here and we can see actually we've got bone starting to form in the horizontal canal so we've got mineralization going on in the horizontal canal we've got increased radio density and bony remodeling that's going on here increased bone uh, deposition on the internal wall of the bulla and this is typical middle ear disease in rabbits where there is persistent grumbling infection that then almost certainly is starting to involve the horizontal canal. With these guys it's always important to radiograph the teeth as well to get a good idea as to whether or not there is dental disease because a lot of them it is associated with dental disease so it's predisposed of course in your short-headed breeds actually this one's not that short-headed um, but in the lops you're more likely to see it because of the abnormal conformation with the dentition and also because the eustachian canal is frequently kinked in these short-headed breeds um, so it doesn't drain the middle ear terribly well so it tends to fill up with fluid and then that provides a ripe environment for bacteria should they then get into it to cause a problem um, and dental disease is often a trigger so they get a dental infection and then the infection in the back of the oropharynx tracks its way up the eustachian canal into the middle ear and then we have middle ear disease um, but in this particular instance not entirely clear how we got middle ear disease but it certainly has in that right ear um, and it has mild torticollis clinically this particular bunny Similarly, so this one here, we've got a similar picture on a close-up here. This is a dental uh, radiography film, um, and we can see the fine detail. So we've got increased sclerosis here um, leading up to the horizontal canal. Um, we've got um, loss of the trabecular detail. So we've actually got trabeculae within that bully that you can see on this side, and it's become sort of bitty and pointy in here, and there's a general infill going on in that particular bulla. Um, so again, um, uh, middle ear disease. Dental disease um, can take obviously many different forms. We can see extreme forms in long-standing cases where we actually get bone deposited, um, so bony projections around it. So long-standing soft tissue abscesses, particularly in the lower jaw, will often stimulate bone production. The rabbit will try and wall off the abscess uh, to contain it. So rabbits have a slightly different strategy for managing abscesses from carnivores, which tend to produce a, an abscess that comes to a point and then ruptures. In the case of rabbits, they tend to try and just wall the thing off uh, to try and uh, 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 prevent it from uh, uh, spreading through the rest of the soft tissue. Um, we can see, however, on this particular slight oblique view that we've taken here, um, that we've got a radiolucent area around this first premolar and possibly second premolar, and we can see there's also um, a bend to that first premolar. Obviously, the dentition should be straight, the teeth should be completely and utterly straight in both arcades. Uh, it's when they start to overgrow that we start to get pressure and that forces the teeth apart, and then they tend to bend, and often the first premolar um, and the last molar are the most curved uh, uh, under pressure, and therefore food packs between the teeth, we then get fermentation of food material, tracking down, it creates an osteomyelitis, which the owner does, is blissfully unaware of. And then literally, yes, when that owner says, oh, well, the abscess suddenly appeared overnight, it probably did, actually. The soft tissue abscess probably did just appear in a couple of days or so, but the infection's been festering away there for some time. The only reason the soft tissue suddenly appeared is because now it's actually eaten its way through the bottom of the jaw, out through the periosteum, and then it's in the soft tissue, and all of a sudden, woof, the thing blows up into a big soft tissue abscess. Um, this one, the owner missed that particular stage, and we've got bone deposition around it as this thing is trying desperately to try and contain that infection. But we can see it's this tooth here, um, possibly that one there, um, that is affected with that and that is causing uh, issues. So if we're going to, well, we're not going to be able to remodel this terribly well. 
some radical surgery. Um, but if we were intending uh, with, a, with a, a milder case, then we would need to consider extracting that particular tooth. And we can see some spectacular dental disease, end stage um, dental failure, where we've got bunnies, we can see here uh, on this lateral view, we've got fractured incisors, we've got incisors um, that are actually meeting end on end. So again, um, without reiterating too much what Richard I'm sure has already uh, spoken to you about, um, lower incisors have a shallow curve to them. Upper incisors have a tight curve, uh, and it works obviously because the jaw is kept apart at a certain angle. If your um, uh, cheek teeth are then chocking the jaw apart, then your jawline is pulled apart. Your tight curved upper incisors, instead of meeting in front of your lower incisors, um, start to curve back on themselves before they hit the lower incisors. And so there becomes a phase when they're hitting end on end, which is what's happening here and here, and that then results in hypermineralization of the tooth. So we actually get irritation at the apical bud because it then starts to force the apical bud to backtrack into the head. That typically often is associated with things like dacrocystitis. So you suddenly see, you know, these milky tears in rabbits because the tear duct, as we'll see in a minute, comes down here, ducts underneath the root of the upper main incisors before then uh, coming out into the nasal passages. Um, but it results in increased mineralization of the tooth and you often get periodontitis. So you get actually poor enameled surfaces, so you've got that nice smooth surface, you start to get ridging, you start to get crumbly teeth associated with it, maybe infection. But actually the problem's back in the jaw and it's associated with these elongating cheek teeth, chocking the mouth progressively open. And we see on this oblique view here, we've got, well, we've got, you know, loss of teeth, teeth have disappeared. We've got fractured teeth here in the incisors and we've got teeth this one here has actually got to the periosteum and is about to punch its way through the periosteum and into the soft tissues. So this particular tooth here, um, this uh, first uh, premolar, which often is the first premolar, um, is starting to punch its way through. Actually, back here, um, this uh, first molar is also trying to do much the same in the upper jaw uh, on this particular oblique view. You can see that's the ramus of the mandible. It should come up to a smooth line that comes across here. And this particular one is trying to burrow its way through there. On this one, we can see this really dystrophic first premolar um, in the lower jaw here that has punched its way eventually through the jaw. So it's become infected. The apical bud has burrowed its way through here. There's obviously osteomyelitis. And now we've got the soft tissue abscess that's suddenly blown up around it because it's now burrowed its way through the jaw. But we can see again um, the incisor issue. Now the owner obviously noticed this, but it also noticed that there was an incisor issue. Um, this bit's been, however, is the cause of that and has been grumbling away there for some time uh, previously. The advantage of two views um, can't be um, uh, underestimated because um, it is incredibly easy to miss things on one view that are actually quite significant. And this particular bunny um, is a typical example. So this is a more or less square on lateral view of this particular bunny. And this is a dorsoventral view. Anybody spot the problem? Yeah. Well, I mean, you see this lot of, there's a lot of gas in here, okay, a lot of soft tissue mod modeling. Actually, the jaw's gone. It's completely fractured its jaw. So it's had a dental infection here on its left side that's been festering away there and it's eaten the jaw and the jaw's broken. Don't quite understand how the rabbit has managed to break its jaw, but the jaw has, has, has fragmented on this side. Now, again, obviously the owner could see the obvious soft tissue swelling on this side. A simple lateral view. Yeah, I've got a lot of soft tissue swelling and I've got a couple of suspect teeth here um, that don't look too good. Um, but actually that view is the real, oh, there really is something going on here. Um, and actually clinically the rabbit, all right, had this you know, gassy, pockety, unpleasant infection here, but the jaw was still in place. Um, there's a lot of, you know, strong masseter muscles in this area that kind of hold everything together, even though that jaw is, is fragmented on that particular side. But yes, we've got serious jaw infection um, and fracture uh, on the left side. And also, we've actually got some quite unpleasant middle ear disease going on in there as well. So you can imagine there's, there's quite a lot of uh, infection going on on that left side of that head. What was the outcome for that one? Um, this barrier actually did okay. <laughs> 
this is one of the ones where you just can't you can't predict how these things are going to work. Um, yes, a shed load of penicillin later, um, and this rabbit's jaw, I did not fix the jaw surgically in any shape or form. The rabbit continued to eat uh, with assist feeding, with a gruel, um, and was remarkably bright, which is why the owner was, you know, kind of reluctant to bring it in. I have had a rabbit, I uh, actually don't have the radiographs of this one because I can't find them. I lost them many years ago. I had a rabbit that had dental disease and developed the, you go beyond the stage where it's hitting end on end, you obviously get the next stage, which is where the lower incisors come out like a sort of a shoof in front of the, of the, of the mouth of the rabbit. And the upper incisors form these sort of, you know, ram's horn like curves and come out the sides. And this rabbit, I'm assuming somehow, had managed, I mean, it had these and the owner hadn't spotted this, they, they'd managed to lock these onto some wire mesh on its cage and then pull its head back um, and actually removed most of its upper jaw um, back to the point of its first premolars. It fractured its palate back here and just pulled the whole upper jaw because the owner brought it in. So I had the incisors and the bit of the hard palate and the rabbit was as bright as a button and you looked at it and I'm, I kid you not, you couldn't have done a better surgical job. There was just a small line, there was no blood, it had just snapped it off and pulled the thing out and that was it. And you kind of went, I don't know what to say really. Um, <laughs> I gave it analgesia, we kept a very close eye on its, on its ability to eat, it seemed to eat okay. We eventually extracted its lower incisors so they didn't have that problem, did okay. But you kind of looked at it and went, really? Um, and then you have other rabbits that look perfectly okay and then just, you know, rabbits can be a bit of a challenge. Um, so yeah, so this one actually did okay, perversely, but there you go. Um, so we talked about Dacryus cystitis when we're getting um, that end-on-end -end disease and that's typically when we see it, I and mean, we can obviously see it associated with you know, pasturalosis and other conditions, and clearly, obviously, myxomatosis, we'll get the periocular edema and so on. But actually, dental um, uh, adacrocystitis um, is really common. Um, so these milky tears, uh, you obviously, you can put your thumb, there's a little lacuna in this area here where the tear duct, they have one single punctum in the lower uh, fornix, um, and they have uh, a little lacuna in dilation in the uh, duct at this point before it goes down uh, and out through the nose and you can put your thumb on that obviously and you can see that the milky tears welling back up into the ventral fornix um, but you can put a little bit of procaine drops in the eye and then you know simply with a with a, a latex catheter you can flush this in in most rabbits they're relatively tolerant to this um, to see whether or not it's patent and we can just see some some milky discharge coming out but actually under sedation uh, we can do a contrast study to actually see what is going on do we have patent ducts or not because we can we can flush that and yes you can get a physical okay the ducts are running through but if you're not getting the duct running through and we want to determine whether or not it is associated with the incisors we can do a contrast study so this is some some iodine 300 conray um, we've put it through both ducts and we have an oblique head view in this particular case, so it's angled. This is the first duct, this is the lacuna here, this little swelling here, so we've put the first dye in, the column of contrast coming down here. This is the uh, incisor, there's the apical bud where the incisor grows from. The contrast hits that, is pinched, but we do see a little bit of the contrast coming out here uh, and into the nasal passage. So that side is still just patent. The other side, we can see the catheter here is, is, is inserted and it's somewhat obscured by the teeth, but actually we can see the contrast coming down to this point here. Um, there's the apical root. There is nothing on the other side of it. That side is completely blocked. Um, so this particular technique is useful because if we're talking about a salvage technique with dacrocystitis and persistent issues, and dental issues, this may guide your decision making as to whether or not you want to extract the incisors. It's no guarantee but extracting the incisors at this point that the duct will then become patent because obviously the damage and the scarring may be permanent. However, in discussion with the owner you can say okay well that upper right side is not flush, I can't flush it and I put the contrast in, it's hitting the end of that, I think it's completely blocked, almost certainly that apical root has occluded um, the duct on that side, you've got dental disease, probably the best thing to do is obviously you know assess what's going on with the cheek teeth clearly because that's probably where it started but actually for these incisors maybe the best thing is to consider extracting them. Um, so it, it, it helps with the decision making. Yeah, 
this one's done it again as well. Sorry, I apologise. This was bigger in the original one. Um, when we're looking at fractures and dislocations and subluxations, as I said, um, uh, the thoracolumbar area is a particularly good area to look for subluxations. And this is a subluxation with actually a compression fracture in this thoracic vertebra here. So you can probably get the impression that this particular line of vertebra and here is meeting at a very acute angle. It should be a curve, clearly. Um, and this is typical with rabbits that are either dropped or that um, uh, have poor uh, bone and muscle strength um, and then uh, kind of do a, you know, they're let out once a year at Easter to run around the room and on a wooden floor and do a wall of death and unfortunately cause an issue. Um, and typically with uh, uh, paresis and paralysis in the hindquarters, this area here is one of the key areas to look at um, because it's a common point uh, for subluxation and compression fractures. What is really, really common in older bunnies is spondylosis. So spinal arthritis, particularly in the lumbar area, but we can also see it in the thoracic area. Um, and straightening the spine out in this particular instance to give us a better idea. We sometimes can see disc mineralization, and certainly Greenwood et al. Um, showed that uh, in some of the giant breeds, we can see um, uh, disc mineralization in some of the Flemish and English giant breeds from as early as three months of age. So stifles, spines, arthritis, really, really common. Common reasons for rabbits not eating cecotrophs. The other one is obesity or dental disease. Um, common reason um, for them getting urine scalding, because obviously when rabbits urinate normally, they're meant to dip the back and obviously pee backwards. Um, but if they've got a sore back, they can't do that, and so they just sit and pee uh, onto their underside. Um, so it is worth checking the spine for these cases. Um, again, rabbits not very good at demonstrating uh, signs of pain and discomfort. Okay, um, so that's a sort of an overview of some um, bunny radiographs. We'll look at some um, ferret ones. Um, this is a, obviously a DV and a lateral of a ferret. Any spot diagnoses? Yeah, I've got an elevated trachea. So we've got the, got the pleural effusion. We can see the lungs up the top here. Okay, we've got something filling in. Trachea is somewhat elevated. What might be going on there? Anything else that we can see maybe in the abdomen? Yeah, looks, looks distended. You may be, it's difficult, you maybe get the impression, there's the triangle just there. That's the bottom of the spleen. Spleen, if you can sort of image it, that's where it rolls around and up. So the rest of the spleen actually tracks all the way back up here. Now, spleens in ferrets are difficult because they're big anyway. They're, they're, as a species, they have a large spleen. Um, but this one is particularly large. Um, and we can see it is, it is deforming the ventral body surface. It's not just because the, the ferret is a bit on the plump side. It is actually quite big. And we've got a pleural effusion going on in here. We've lost detail. What you know, do you think is most likely in this particular case? Lymphoma. Yeah, sure as eggs is eggs, it probably is lymphoma. We could have cardiac failure, so that we've got congestion uh, associated with that. Um, that is a possibility. Quite often in my experience with cardiac failure, they often develop pulmonary edema rather than pleural effusions, but it's, it is a possibility. Um, but yes, lymphoma, ferrets, very common, um, quite possible. Again, they have a thymus that persists into adulthood, um, obviously, uh, spleen is a primary organ site, um, and actually if we've got it on both sides of the diaphragm, then on a scaling basis, that's really not terribly good news. Uh, but we're draining the chest here, and then post-draining uh, of the chest, uh, and we can see um, this cranial cardiac uh, mass in here, still a, a large spleen in this area here. Um, but uh, yeah, a, a relatively normal heart size. We'll talk about uh, cardiac scoring in ferrets in a second. We can, however, obviously see other issues, and we may see pulmonary abscesses. These ones are much more difficult to pick up uh, radiographically. Um, we can see the spleen again on this particular side. So the spleen always does look big in ferrets, um, and in some cases it is just almost impossible on imaging to tell whether a spleen is neoplastic or not. Um, and so, you know, a lot of people believe um, that they can tell on 
ultrasound, whether or not a spleen is neoplastic and in advanced stages, yes, you can. Uh, and just an overall size, you may be able to get a pretty good idea. But actually, unfortunately, you are going to have to biopsy the thing. You, there is no two ways about it um, uh, to get a definitive diagnosis. Imaging will only do so much. Um, but in this particular case, we've got a lung abscess here on the right side um, associated uh, with uh, probably a pericarditis that's actually tying the heart down um, to the right side here. So not every um, chest lesion in ferrets is associated with lymphoma. Um, and we can see some aberrant issues with calcification with age. So we see we've got a lot of mineralization uh, of the sternal vertebra in this particular ferret. This is a more normal sized spleen. Um, so you can see it's still quite a large organ here, um, quite a strap-like organ that runs the whole width of the body, but it's a, a more uh, normal size. We can see the left kidney in here, right kidney's up here, liver shadow in this region here. See how narrow the thoracic inlet is in this case here, and how difficult it is to image anything cranial um, to the heart, and on a DV, um, again, difficult to see the lung field. But we've got a lot of of mineralization of the bronchi in this area, a lot of mineralization of the versternal vertebrae. Um, and these are often associated with um, older ferrets, ferrets that are maybe potentially uh, uh, supplemented with additional uh, multivits. Um, so we see it typically associated with hypervitaminosis A. They're relatively tolerant of that, but hypervitaminosis D is quite common in these cases as well. Um, and we can get owners that uh, are feeding um, cat and dog supplements in addition to a ferret food. Um, to uh, ferrets where we get this mineralization occurring. We can also see ectopic mineralization though uh, with some forms of lymphoma. So that's another possibility. You get ectopic mineralization like in rabbits with kidney stones? Yeah, it's it, in my experience it's less common in ferrets and we don't see kidney stones very commonly in ferrets uh, either. Um, but yes, it is theoretically possible, um, but uh, it, it tends to be more commonly associated obviously with nutrition, um, but or, uh, with ectopic um, uh, neoplastic, paraneoplastic disease. So, um, hearts. Um, in ferrets, we know that heart disease is an issue, um, and in this particular case, we can see this is a, perhaps a more normal heart shape, uh, lozenge connected to the um, uh, diaphragm on this side, um, uh, leaning forward at a sort of 45 degree angle, slightly more globoid heart in here, which is perhaps an early um, stage heart failure or cardiomyopathy, and dilated cardiomyopathy is common in ferrets. Um, so there is a vertebral heart score that's been worked out for a number of years, uh, and typically like with any other, we're measuring it against um, a thoracic vertebra. So we're looking at the right long axis, so a right lateral view, the right long axis from heart base to heart apex, um, uh, adding that to the uh, right uh, short axis at its widest, so at 90 degrees to that, the widest point um, of the heart, and dividing that by the total length between the fifth, um, at start of the fifth and the end of the eighth thoracic vertebra in centimetres, which gives us a mean of 1.35 in males and 1.34 in females, and gives us a bit of an idea as to whether or not we have cardiac um, enlargement. Obviously, um, uh, ultrasound uh, may give us more information as well. Um, we can look at elevation of the uh, trachea, but because of the very narrow um, thoracic inlet, that often happens quite late on in the disease, and actually the trachea is quite close to the thoracic vertebra um, in a healthy ferret because of that very narrow conical chest. And so it is somewhat difficult to interpret that. So it's not the world's most reliable tracheal elevation. Um, neither is contact with the sternum. Um, we really do need to, to have a look at vertebral uh, heart scores. Mm -hmm. Sorry, yeah. Would you have arrhythmia or a heart rumor in this case? Like what would you, if you were listening to the heart, do you have anything? Uh, it depends on the stage of the of the disease. So if we have advanced um, cardiomyopathy, then yes, you frequently do have a murmur in these cases. Um, and in ferrets, we don't see uh, uh, murmurs as a physiological process as we do in cats. Um, so yes, but actually early stages, they may be silent. Um, so we don't actually see anything in the early stages until we get significant valvular insufficiency. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Sorry, say what? Um, yeah, I mean, there's theoretically no reason why not, and there's no reason why you can't use cardiac troponin. 
Um, the problem with it is, is that um, in early stages, what the normal values are and cut off for a ferret, um, are, there, there are, there's very little in the literature out there. So yes, you can use those as an early stage, um, uh, sorry, as a later stage indicator of cardiac disease. But by that stage, radiographically, um, and on ultrasound, you've usually got uh, uh, fairly significant changes anyway. Um, but yes, it, it, is, it is possible to use those. You do get elevations in late stage heart disease. You also quite often get pulmonary edema associated with it as well. So we get increased fluffy densities, particularly um, in the caudal lung fields, um, less radiolucent associated uh, with uh, cardiac failure. Um, and that's more typically associated with cardiac failure than pleural effusions. We say pleural effusions in ferrets, more typically associated with things like lymphoma, uh, thymic lymphoma. Um, Abdomen-wise, uh, this is a relatively normal abdomen. So again, um, we're seeing the, um, the spleen back. Actually, this one's quite far caudal. There's a little triangle, the spleen back here, coming up to this point here. Um, we can see a little bit of gas in the digestive system. The liver is a slightly bigger organ than it is in the rabbit, not quite so flattened. Um, osteoarthritis in the hips is quite common. And actually, to be fair, there's a little bit of uh, flattening off of the uh, humeral heads in these cases. Uh, we may see spondylosis in the spine, uh, but actually the body form is relatively uh, um, straightforward, very similar to a domestic cat, but in a more elongated streamlined fashion. Um, and uh, you can just about see the sort of left kidney shadow in here, right kidney shadows up the top here. Um, nothing particularly um, interesting, but it's worth noting that we often have in adult ferrets still open growth plates. And we'll see this in, in rodents as well. We do see it in, in rabbits to a certain extent, um, but open growth plates, particularly in hind limbs, particularly in tibias and femurs, um, as adult ferrets are common. It's not quite the case with rats. Rats, a lot of the growth plates never close. Um, you know, even as, as aged rats, they're still open. Um, urolithiasis is an occasional issue in ferrets. It's usually associated with owners that insist upon trying to convert their ferret into a vegetarian. They are strict uh, uh, carnivores and feeding plant protein is not good for ferrets. It results in urolithiasis. If you feed enough of it, it can result in hyperammonemia, seizures uh, and other issues as well. You can see, however, this ferret is remarkably plump. Um, uh, as you can sort of see by the soft tissue uh, external abdominal uh, levels and the distended abdomen, the spleen is sort of hidden in here. It's not particularly large. We can see very obvious, nice looking kidneys because there's so much fat in there that's giving us the nice contrast. Liver tucked away up here. It's got hypermineralization uh, of the sternebrae. Um, but we've got a really nice collection of calcium oxalate, which is usually calcium oxalate. Uh, crystals in the urinary bladder. We may also um, develop uh, uroliths, uh, renoliths, sorry, uh, uh, in addition to this, uh, although those are slightly less commonly seen in my experience than in the domestic rabbits. Um, we've also probably got a bit of cystitis. You can see actually this is really nicely um, outlined with all the fat that this, this ferret has got, um, the bladder lining, which is really quite thick. Um, so there probably is a persistent cystitis uh, in this particular uh, gill. Yeah, over the back here. Yes. So this is this is a, a gill. We've got um, uh, Hobbs. I've got a, a, a J-shaped os penis. Um, I don't know if I've actually seen one in one of these ones, or whether or not. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, we have got one in a second, but uh, Hobbs have got a, a J-shaped os penis, um, which will cause, um, you know, significant problems with uh, uroliths being passed. Jills often will pass the smaller stones, but with some discomfort. Uh, but this is a, this is a Jill. Um, again, it's worth looking at things like stifles. They're not quite as prone to osteoarthritis um, as rabbits in this area because they don't have quite the hyperflexed uh, knee joints, but they are still as with any animal with age, uh, prone uh, to a progressive uh, meniscal damage. Ah, there's a hob. So you can see the J-shaped uh, os penis here. So this is a real problem if you get a urolith because uh, actually catheterizing hobs is a bit of a faff because they've got quite a small urethra and you've also got to threadle it round 
uh, the bend of the urethra. So slippery sands and things like that are actually ideal for ferrets because they're lubricated and they're fine and they're flexible uh, and they make life a little bit easier for catheterization. Um, so again, we're back to spleen. So we've got the spleen here, so the triangle at the bottom, and you get the impression that actually the spleen here rises up to this point up here, and that is all spleen. And again, we've got a distended abdomen, um, could be associated with obesity. We've got a left kidney up the top here, we've got a right kidney, but actually this spleen is sufficiently big that it warrants further investigation. I think that's about as good as you can say on this particular thing. It doesn't tell us that that's near plastic, it just tells us that it's big and it's probably worth looking at. Um, the heart is possibly also slightly enlarged. We've got a nice pre-cardiac area there. We can't see an enlarged uh, thymic mass in that area. It's probably worth doing a cardiac uh, score on this particular individual as well, just to see whether or not we do have a slightly enlarged heart. Um, but yes, enlarged spleens and ferrets, uh, a common problem. Um, and then dental disease, really, really common, um, particularly when they're being fed homemade diets uh, or naturalistic diets. So they're being fed a sort of a pelleted food, then it tends to be slightly less common, but they get a lot of um, neck lesions. They get resorptive lesions uh, that result uh, in uh, erosion um, and uh, we get a lot of uh, obviously gingivitis and periodontal recession associated with it. Um, so radiographing these guys um, we can do um, obviously lateral um, and um, uh, ventrodorsal views to look at the teeth. We can also do bisecting angle radiographs. Um, so bisecting angles, so if you've got a, uh, a canine tooth um, obviously, it's got a, got a curve on it, um, and if you put um, a radiographic plate uh, straight in the mouth and then try and take um, a straight ventrodorsal view of that, we're going to get the shadow of that foreshortened. So it makes life very, very difficult to interpret what's going on um, within the tooth as a whole. Um, so we can take the angle of the plate and we can take the angle of the tooth. So we draw a line through the angle of the tooth itself. Um, and we want to go 90 degrees to that particular line. OK, so we want to bisect that angle and that will then give us an image on the plate that is more true reflection of that um, complete tooth laid out as if it was plonked flat. Um, on the plate. So find the angle of your tooth, put the plate in, and then we want to go 90 degrees to that to cast our shadow of our tooth onto the plate uh, and get a, 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 a complete image of that um, tooth. But dental disease is really common uh, in ferrets. Um, rodents, spot the rodent, name the species. Close. Chinchilla. It's a chinchilla, yes. Okay, it's a chinchilla. So um, the degus do have large tympanic bully as well, but they're not quite as big as um, the chinchilla. So large tympanic bully. Uh, we'll see some images. This is a little bit uh, difficult to see the number of teeth, but we can tell it's a rodent because it's got um, only uh, one pair of upper incisors uh, as opposed to a lagomorph. It's got large tympanic bully. Uh, it's also only got four cheek teeth in each dental arcade. Rabbits obviously have um, uh, six cheek teeth uh, in the upper arcades and five in the lower normally, although a lot of lops actually have five cheek teeth in the upper and five in the lower. So that's one radiographic abnormality you may regularly turn up with a lot of lop breeds and probably explains why they're uh, also more prone to dental disease. Um, but the chinchilla body form is more bird-like. You can see it's elongated, um, quite fragile, uh, quite brittle bones. They didn't tend to explode. Um, to be fair, rabbit bones tend to explode quite well on uh, uh, compression as well. Um, the long tail, obviously. Um, and um, body organ-wise, though, similar body um, abdominal layout to the domestic rabbits. We've got a flattened liver tucked underneath the rib cage. We always have a full stomach, which also should be tucked underneath the rib cage. A cecum on the ventral floor. We've got a little bit of gas in the large bowel there. Um, and the intestinal mass sandwiched in between cecum um, and uh, stomach. And on the uh, uh, dorsoventral view here, um, we can see um, the sort of underlying area of the cecum. Um, we can see a little bit of gas there in the large bowel, which is a little bit abnormal. Food in the stomach on the left side here, and the very flattened liver. And again, the very small 
um, chest uh, space um, with the heart um, obviously therefore looking uh, quite large in that area and on the dorsal ventral view because of the curve of the back of the chinchilla it's actually quite difficult to see um, the intervertebral spaces uh, in the thorax because you're looking at it looking at the curve um, superimposing vertebral bodies on each other but we can see the tympanic bully these are really obvious um, in uh, chinchillas um, and serve as a useful marker when we're looking at things like dental disease. This particular rodent, give it away on the feet. What species is that? It's a guinea pig, it's got three toes. Um, so yes, it has to be a guinea pig. Um, big chunky head, quite a elongated body form again. Um, this particular one has got a significant problem. Um, and so we've got a bit of a gas pocket in the stomach. Okay, so the stomach should always be full, shouldn't have that sort of big gas pocket in it. We can see left kidney, right kidney. We can see quite a full urinary bladder, although there doesn't appear to be any obvious silt in it. Liver's a bit large, okay, it's coming right the way back here beyond the the sort of um, uh, uh, rib cage here, so we've got possibly an enlarged liver that might be falsely pushed down by the gas that's in the stomach and it's actually pushing the liver down, so difficult to interpret that. Um, but we can see quite a lot of gas there. This is a dorsal ventral view here. Um, what do we think subjectively of that? Yeah, it does look a bit rounded. We've got a little bit of lung fill up here. We've got a lot of fluffy density here, a lot of fluffy density. We do have a thymus that persists into adulthood in most rodents. This is a bit of an expiratory view, so it's not the world's greatest view in that sense. But actually the heart itself is quite uh, enlarged and pulmonary edema is really common in these guys and cardiomyopathy is really common um, in guinea pigs. Uh, in some cases it's associated uh, with um, hypothyroidism. They can suffer from hypothyroidism, um, but we occasionally also see hypertrophic cardiomyopathy because hyperthyroidism is actually quite common in guinea pigs as well. Um, so uh, cardiomegaly, heart failure in these cases, uh, we can see similar conditions that we see in uh, domestic cats and dogs. In smaller rodents, um, this is a rat chest, and this is typically what we see with mycoplasma. So we can see the sort of heart shadow, again, imaging at this sort of um, smaller guys, the, the imaging quality tends to suffer, um, but we can get the idea that there are cannonball lumps in these lungs. Now that could be um, uh, neoplastic disease, but actually in rats and mice, that is typically associated with mycoplasma. Um, and we get these um, circular abscesses throughout the lung fields. Um, the dorsal ventral view, a bit more difficult to actually see what's going on. You can get a bit of an idea of some of the lumps in here. Um, but the lateral view, yeah, okay, we've definitely got some abnormalities in that area, uh, which are typical with mycoplasma. Clearly for mycoplasmal disease, we could also do serology uh, on these guys. Uh, there are commercial laboratory tests uh, for uh, serology for mycoplasma. To be fair, it's just desperately common. Um, uh, and radiography can give you a bit of an indication prognostically as to how bad the situation is and whether it's likely um, to respond to long-term antibiotic medication or not. Severe ones like that are much less likely to, um, to respond. Um, okay, so this is um, another um, uh, chinchilla. Uh, and uh, in this particular case, um, we've got, um, so not another chinchilla, this is another rat, I beg your pardon, this is a rat. Um, we've got the smaller tympanic uh, bully, uh, but we've also got a male, we've got a little tiny Oz penis just down the back here. So a lot of the rodents, the males do have fragments or spicules of bone uh, in the Oz penis, so particularly the Neuridae. Um, very flattened uh, diaphragm. In older rats, it is typical to see um, mineralization of the sternal um, vertebra. Um, and it's also um, quite often difficult to see uh, what's going on in front of the, uh, the heart itself because there is significant thymic tissue in adults. We don't um, see anywhere near as commonly as ferrets uh, uh, lymphoma in rats and mice, but it does occasionally occur. But that actual filling in there is typical um, in, in even adult rats and mice 
with thymic tissue. But this is a more normal lung field in comparison to the previous one, um, so that we can see um, uh, no uh, uh, pulmonic uh, abscessation. Digestive tract wise, they don't have a big cecum, obviously. Um, they just have um, a, a, a relatively uh, uninteresting uh, small intestine and large intestine, uh, more omnivorous in nature. Stomachs tend not to be particularly full. Um, so they may or may not be, depending on obviously how recently the thing is eaten. Um, but it's not unusual to find a small um, stomach uh, uh, on radiography. Um, and as we mentioned, uh, growth plates in these guys uh, often are open, particularly in the tibia uh, area, and sometimes uh, also on the wings of the ilia, um, even in aged rats. The other thing to look for is that we often, this one's not that bad actually, get spondylosis in the lumbar and thoracic area of the spine, um, and injuries to the spine, and this one's actually got a tilted vertebral body at this point here and a compressed vertebral body at this point here are common when these guys are dropped um, or when they fall off shelves and so on as, as older animals. And often this thoracolumbar area can then result in obviously paresis um, and paralysis in the hind limbs. There are obviously many other causes of that in old rats. Um, so osteoarthritis of the hips um, certainly is really common. Um, as I say, lumbar uh, osteoarthritis um, and uh, neurological disease, a chronic degenerative radicular myopathy or a condition similar to that seen in German shepherd dogs has been reported in, uh, in rats as well. Um, and then we've got some, um, some more guinea pigs um, in here. These ones um, are associated uh, with some uh, interesting conditions. This one's a more normal thorax, although very badly positioned in the, in the abdomen. Uh, but this one here um, is uh, showing you significant cardiomegaly uh, in this particular instance. Um, and this one actually also had um, loss of detail in the abdomen. So it did actually, it was quite plump in the first instance, but it also actually had uh, ascites associated with congestive heart failure, and this one had a dilated cardiomyopathy. Uh, so um, guinea pigs, certainly cardiac disease, very, very common. We see it less commonly in degus and chinchillas, um, and uh, we see it occasionally in other rodents, particularly things like hamsters. We can also see gastric dilatation um, and cecal dilatation associated uh, with clostridiosis. And this particular chinchilla here has got significant uh, gas distension. We can see this is obviously the cecum again. We've got the house tree, we've got the compartmentalized structures, but we've also got a significant gas pocket um, in the stomach. Um, um, this one obviously had clinical uh, uh, abdominal distension. This chap over here um, is again badly positioned, but it just gives you an idea of just how much abdominal distension you can get with cystic ovarian disease. This is a hamster, it's just plonked inside a ring, um, just to radiograph it consciously. Um, but it just demonstrates that actually things like cystic ovarian disease are incredibly difficult to diagnose radiographically. The soft tissue density is exactly the same as the rest of the abdomen. And so all you get is an image of a full abdomen. These guys are much better, as we'll see in a minute, um, diagnosed, diagnosed via ultrasound. And this is a guinea pig with cystic ovarian disease showing a similar thing. So more normal heart structure over here, a um, little bit of gas up in the stomach in here, cecum on the floor. These actually are the ovaries. It's actually really difficult to differentiate those from kidney area and from general large intestine area. Um, we can't really get a clear idea as to what is going on in there on a radiograph. These are not easy to diagnose, so ultrasound is preferred for these guys. And having spoken about gastric dilatation, this is another gastric dilatation case, but this particular one um, we think is associated with uh, pain and discomfort. And actually both of these ones, there's gas um, in uh, the large bowel in this particular case and a slightly gassy looking stomach, quite a full stomach with some gas pockets around it in this uh, um, chinchilla. And both of these are associated with urolithiasis. So we can see uroliths here at the brim of the pelvis and in this one, we've actually got a renal lift showing up at the back here um, as well. And again, um, chinchillas, calcium oxalate is usually um, the suspect in these cases. 
um, as opposed to calcium carbonate in bunnies. Um, so it's often associated with feeding high oxalate containing diets. So there are certain um, uh, leafy greens that are high in oxalates. So things like um, beetroot tops, spinach, these are all high in oxalates. Um, or just feeding a diet that's high in calcium uh, with plant material because there's oxalates in most leafy greens to be fair at low levels and if you increase calcium levels um, in chinchillas just like rabbits they will actively excrete the calcium through their kidneys like any animal um, but actually they have um, no significant ability to down regulate the amount of calcium that's absorbed from the gut they will pump it out into the urine we don't see the sludgy bladders as often, and this maybe reflects the fact that uh, um, uh, owners are mainly feeding uh, chinchillas on uh, proprietary uh, hay and chinchilla pellets and are rarely uh, feeding juvenile formulas, which is often the case with rabbit owners feeding juvenile formulas for too long. Um, but uh, often these uroliths um, will be lodged at the neck of the, uh, the bladder um, at the brim of the pelvis is generally where they get stuck and obviously cause intense pain and discomfort. And renaliths, uh, as with rabbits, are very, very painful. But we may see actual secondary signs associated with digestive upset and gaseous distension, um, which are secondary to the original pain. Dental problems in chinchillas are really common, as they are in rabbits. And these are two uh, radiographs of both an, a normal chinchilla head um, and an abnormal uh, chinchilla head. Um, and this just demonstrates that the, the benefit of um, getting as square on a view as you possibly can um, to try and assess what is going on. So these guys have got really nice auditory bullies, so we can use these to overlay um, to try and ensure we've got a square on view. Uh, we can see, first of all, we've got four cheek teeth in each quadrant. We've got um, the typical rodent incisors, so two upper, two lower, um, shallow curve in the lower, tight curve in the upper, similar to rabbits. And here we can see a similar syndrome that we described in rabbits occurring where the mouth has been chocked open because of elongated cheek teeth. Um, and we can see that's happened because the incisors have started hitting end on end and actually one of them has started to curl back um, into the uh, hard palate. We've got a fractured crown here um, on this particular cheek tooth. We can also see if we look at the line of the jaw down here, these apical roots are quite close to the jaw line, um, but these ones are actually starting to deform the jaw line. And obviously we can often feel these things clinically on the underside of the jaw. This also shows you why we get the clinical symptoms of sneezing and epiphora and so on in these guys. Here's the orbit of the eye, zygomatic arch here. And we can see these two um, roots of these teeth are actually pressing on the inside of the uh, globe of the eye. Um, so that'll cause epiphora. These ones are pressing up, particularly this one, into the nasal passages, so we often get intermittent sneezing and irritation. It looks as if we've lost the apical buds in these particular cases. We haven't lost the apical buds. What we're seeing is a line of sight issue because the actual tooth, you can get an idea that there's a bend forming here. Again, these teeth are now under pressure as the jaw is chocked open, it can only go so far. So the teeth has got to keep growing. So eventually the teeth start to bend and come apart. So we get increased gaps between the teeth. The teeth become banana shaped. And actually the apical bud is still there. It's just now that the, instead of it being lateral and we're looking at the apical bud on the top of the tooth, the tooth is now curved towards us in a banana shape like that. And we're looking at the apical bud overlying the top of the, to or top of the root of the tooth. So actually we lose that lucency. We're now just looking at the tooth. Um, but we can also get an impression in early, this is quite a late stage, we can get an impression of early stage disease. If we put this out on a sheet of paper, we should be able to draw a line down the frontal um, uh, plane here across the, uh, uh, the nasal bones and the, and the, and the uh, frontal sinus bones and a line along the ventral aspect of the mandible. And those two lines, as they go away from the head uh, or lateral view of a chinchilla, should slowly converge. Okay. Um, and there should often at rest be a, an obvious gap between um, the teeth. Um, with teeth that are starting to elongate, you draw that line, it, it becomes parallel and then obviously progressively starts to diverge. And you can get the impression that this particular line is starting to diverge out, um, which is showing you that the mouth is being chocked open. 
Um, so this one is obviously clearly quite an, an advanced case and therefore relatively easy to diagnose. But in early cases, it's a, a useful technique to pick up on early crown elongation. How much lucency is normal around the apical bud? Is it normal to have some lucency or a struggle to notice? Yes. So, these, so, so these, these, these guys here, these circular lucencies are absolutely normal. Um, and what you'll get um, is you'll get a fine line um, that'll appear on the other side, which is effectively um, the interface between the apical bud and the jaw. Um, what you often find with infection is that that line disappears and actually you don't get a clear break. You actually often start to get little channels starting to form. We'll see in some of the larger herbivores, um, which are, are easier to see because of the magnification, uh, where you start to get then breakdown in this particular line. And obviously anything that starts to deform the, the line of the jaw, the jaw line should be smooth, starts to come through the line of the jaw, and that's, that's very obvious. But yes, it's difficult in these images to see what's going on because you're now looking at apical bud superimposed on tooth root. Obviously, other dental issues, we can see end-stage dental disease, particularly in chinchillas. So we've got multiple lost teeth in these cases. We can get serious spurring of teeth in these guys and abscessation associated with it. So this particular uh, sole here has got some, on this oblique view, um, some significant um, uh, premolar spurring, obviously some really abnormal looking incisors that are splitting apart uh, and uh, elongated. This is actually a, um, a, a a chipmunk uh, in this particular case. Um, and these guys um, uh, do not have um, continuously erupting uh, molars. Um, they, they, a bit like sort of um, uh, uh, rat and mouse teeth. Um, they, they, they grow through an early phase and then they wear and eventually will hypermineralize um, and erode. So when we actually get um, incisor damage, it's often associated with traumatic damage to jaws. And this one actually has got a fractured uh, symphysis or the symphysis has separated it's more of a fibrous union at that point and in this particular case which has led to abnormal incisor bite and therefore incisor overgrowth so with these guys the muridae the uh, scuridae um, the crichetidae we rarely get um, cheek tooth problems um, those are more associated with aged animals where we maybe get loss of teeth uh, and therefore very, very occasionally problems. It's more incisor associated, which is more typically associated with trauma, uh, either jaw trauma uh, or physical tooth trauma and breaking of the teeth. Um, but when we're talking about the hystricomorphs, then they're much more like the lagomorphs. Um, they've got continuous uh, elodont dentition as far as the, uh, the cheek teeth, uh, as well as the incisors are concerned. And so we get uh, issues with overgrowth in those instances. Um, in Smaller guys, these again are dental films. This is a hamster. Um, we can get quite good images using dental films. Things like this, this is a fibrosarcoma associated with a carpal joint um, where we can see erosion of carpal tissue. We can see that it is largely uh, non-mineralized. So it's obviously mesenchymal in nature uh, in this particular one, but we can see erosion uh, on uh, the uh, metacarpi and the carpi. Um, we get spondylosis really, really commonly in old rodents. So we get mineralization uh, of discs uh, and we get bridging uh, occurring in these guys as well. Um, and we can also get um, issues uh, with, again, um, uh, disc space narrowing. So we've got a, a lumbar sacral disc space narrowing associated with this one. Um, and uh, in this particular instance, we got uh, evidence uh, of osteoarthritis uh, in the hip. So we've got a slightly more normal hip joint on this side here. And on this one, we've got spurring associated with it, increased sclerosis, um, and a generally shallower uh, dysplastic hip that's then become osteoarthritic uh, in this instance. So it is possible um, to uh, do radiography and get images out of these guys. And certainly with digital radiography, it's still possible. We're going to talk about a technique um, for um, uh, I'll mention a technique for um, magnifying um, uh, images, uh, which can be useful. Um, and uh, dental film, as I say, is another alternative if you have. Do any of you have dental uh, machines in practice? Yeah? Okay. Um, they are really useful for the little guys. So we'll just do a little bit on small mammal ultrasound before the break. Um, positioning. 
Uh, most of these guys um, we, we can do obviously consciously. We can, uh, um, if we can get them into lateral recumbency for cardiac assessment, then that's fine. But to be brutally honest, most of these guys we're doing standing. Um, equipment wise, um, clearly at seven and a half uh, megahertz for things like uh, rabbits, chinchillas, and so on uh, is preferred. If we're talking about um, big bunnies, maybe a five, but actually most of the little guys, we want the ability to uh, have a, up to a 10 megahertz um, and potentially using a standoff. Um, now you can buy expensive standoffs, but actually a lot of us just use um, a latex glove filled with gel um, and you can get relelatively decent uh, images. And these are typical images uh, of cardiac abnormalities in, in bunnies. Um, so we're going uh, in this particular instance uh, from the left side uh, and we're looking in this case uh, across the outflow of the aorta. Um, so we've got the aortic valves here and we've got increased uh, uh, echogenicity in this area here which is typical in bunnies associated with atherosclerosis and maybe a cause of uh, chronic heart failure, um, so back heart failure. Um, in, in rabbits, they're often used as a, uh, a model for human atherosclerosis. We occasionally get uh, things like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in rabbits. We mentioned it in uh, guinea pigs and chinchillas. And we're looking at cross section here um, through um, the left ventricle. Um, we can't see the right ventricle at this level, but we've got uh, significant thickening uh, of the wall uh, of the left ventricle in this particular case. Valvular disease with age is really common. This is the mitral valve, and we can see in this particular instance, we've actually got two flaps associated with the mitral valve, uh, associated with trauma um, and uh, chronic degenerative changes with age. Um, and again, across the, from the left side and across the heart base. Um, and then occasionally thromboembolic disease. Um, so again, this is looking at the um, aortic outflow in this particular rabbit, uh, and we've actually got valvular associated bacterial endocarditis um, causing thromboembolic disease. Um, this is particularly common in things like hamsters, which are incredibly difficult um, to get a decent image on on ultrasound because of the small footprint. Um, but in larger uh, small mammals, slightly easier to see, often associated with uh, urinary tract infections, um, uh, so particularly cystitis, renaliths and things of that nature, uh, but bacterial endocarditis, not uncommon. Um, visceral organs, livers uh, in rabbits are flattened organs, they've got a significant gallbladder, echogenicity is typically that what you'd expect in dogs and cats. Uh, we often get uh, the images of the spleen coming in for contrast, which is similar in echogenicity to the liver, maybe slightly less uh, homogenous. Uh, in nature. The big problem with uh, um, imaging um, rabbit abdomens is the amount of gas that you get quite often. Um, so sometimes it is difficult to pick up on clear images. This is an image of the left kidney uh, in a rabbit, typical bean-shaped kidney, a normal one. This one over here is a clearly a very abnormal uh, left kidney in this rabbit associated with end-stage chronic uh, renal failure. Um, rabbits, this is, this is common with age, but it can also occur obviously with diseases like encephalitis zoon uh, and obviously uh, renaliths with recurrent pyelonephritis. But again, um, lack of uh, 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 differentiation between cortex and medulla, no obvious calyx system. We've actually got urine pocketing. This one is actually associated uh, with a renalith. We've got a hyperechoic area uh, just in here and we've got physis of a, of a kidney uh, as a result of it. We go back to that bunny that had the uterine adenocarcinoma and this is typically what one sees uh, with a uterine adenocarcinoma. So this is at the level um, of the cervices. You see the two cervices here and then we're moving uh, cranial in the rabbit uh, down one um, a part of the uterus not technically a horn because it's a duplex uterus, um, but we can actually see here we've got evidence of uh, fluid uh, in this particular area and then a large fleshy uh, mass protruding into the lumen and overall um, you know each one of these is a centimeter. We've actually got significant um, uh, 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 dilation uh, of the uterus in this case. So easier to pick up on clearly on ultrasound soft tissue uh, 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 masses than it is on um, uh, radiogra radiography. How much do you think of looking for adrenals in, in um, rabbits? 
Um, in rabbits, adrenals are difficult to locate, in my experience, because of the gas. I mean, it is possible to pick it up um, in... So if you look at this particular one, so this is left kidney. This here um, is the uh, caudal vena cava, um, and this here is adrenal, okay? So that little circle just there. Um, so it is possible to pick them up. The, your problem is gas pocketing. The right adrenal is an absolute pig to find um, because it is tucked, obviously, underneath the rib cage. number one, and number two, there is usually a loop of small intestine uh, just around it with gas. But yeah, you, you, you can pick up adrenal. So yeah, kidney, kidney outline, caudal vena cava, adrenal in there, usually surrounded by a little bit of fat. Um, adrenal disease, um, in my experience with rabbits, is not particularly common, but yeah, it is, it is, it is possible to, to pick it up. Um, Ferrets um, and uh, heart disease, the, the issue that we find with ferrets often is getting a small enough footprint to get between the ribs and the issues with the ribs often being quite well mineralized in older ferrets. Um, so we've got an image of a long axis in particular here. Um, so we've got uh, left, right ventricle, uh, sorry, left, right atria, left, right ventricle in here. Um, we can see um, increased echogenicity in this particular case um, on um, the right AV valve, possibly also on the left. In cross-section here, mitral valve, we've certainly got increased echogenicity and we've actually also got evidence of a tear. So we've got a little bit of valve that's flapping about in this particular case. No serious pericardial effusion uh, in this particular case. Um, it's worth noting that you get a lot of side echo uh, associated with the ribs um, uh, because of the small footprint that you need uh, with bounce back on these things. Um, and in some cases you may also be able to pick up on a little bit of thymic tissue uh, associated uh, in front of the in front of the heart, but that can be difficult to assess because it is so far underneath um, the uh, elbow of the ferret. Um, and we talked about spleens, and this is a more normal spleen um, in a ferret, um, and the homogeneity of that. We've got uh, the left kidney um, just down in, in here, bean-shaped, um, typical ferret kidney in here. We've actually got a little bit of a uh, a neoplasm over here, uh, which was actually uh, an unassociated uh, lymphoma, not associated with the spleen. This was in a lymph node. Um, and this is liver um, that's in the middle here. So we've got spleen, liver, uh, a little bit of a mass over this side, left kidney uh, in this area here. So spleen and liver look actually very similar. They lie tight to each other. Um, there will be an interface between the two, but that's a relatively normal looking um, spleen. We'll show you some abnormal spleens in a minute. Um, but adrenal disease is the big one in, in, in ferrets um, that we typically see um, and picking up the adrenal glands um, can um, be a little, a little tricky. So we've got the kidney just down here um, and then we're heading back towards the caudal vena cava in this area in here. Um, and uh, the adrenal gland itself tends to be hypoechoic. Um, there's often uh, increased density with a fat pad around it. Um, and if you look in your notes, there are varying different uh, measurements uh, associated with adrenal. There's quite a lot of uh, publications on adrenal disease measurement using ultrasound. Some people have suggested that um, overall measurements um, can uh, give you an accurate assessment, um, both length and diameter. Um, of um, uh, adrenal disease. Uh, it obviously clearly doesn't tell you whether or not the neoplasm is benign or malignant because you can get adenomas, you can get adenocarcinomas. To be fair, as far as the ferret's concerned, um, they, it physiologically makes relatively little difference because both are productive. Um, it can be very difficult to pick up in the early stages because we don't get a lot of detail about what's going on inside the actual adrenal itself. But there is some suggestion that if you look at the, at the fat that surrounds this, so if you look at the fat there, it's fairly homogenous around this. This is a, a normal looking adrenal in this particular ferret. Um, this one here, slightly irregular shape, but we've also lost fat. This is the, the, the caudal vena cava coming in here on this particular image, and we've lost fat between adrenal uh, and caudal vena cava. So this is the right adrenal gland. And although that cross-section, well, it is a little bit big, so this is a, a cross-section of this particular one uh, at 11 millimeters, um, there is loss of fat between the adrenal 
and the caudal vena cava. And there's some suggestion in a couple of publications that loss of fat in that area um, is associated with adenocarcinomas, much more likely to be associated with malignant neoplasms. As I say, to be fair to the ferret, it doesn't really make a lot of difference because physiologically, both of them will exhibit signs of adrenal disease. And the best way of diagnosing that is to do a triple hormone panel, as I'm sure you're, you're all well aware. We'll talk more about in the, in the ferret uh, day um, to measure um, uh, estradiol 17, uh, hydroxyprogesterone and uh, androstene dione. Uh, for which there are normal values published, uh, and that's the usual way of diagnosing uh, or confirming adrenal disease. But ultrasound can be used overall enlargement of the adrenal, um, and then this suggestion that loss of fat between adrenal and caudal vena cava uh, may also indicate um, uh, malignancy. We talked about ovarian disease and how it's difficult to show up on radiograph, but it shows up really, really well as this typical dark hypoechoic bunch of grapes um, on ultrasound. So they're easy to diagnose on ultrasound. To be fair, you can pretty much palpate them. And if it's a guinea pig, it's a gerbil or it's a hamster and it's got a distended abdomen and smooth visci within it, um, then it's highly likely, if, uh, obviously if it's a female, it's going to be cystic ovarian disease. But we can uh, certainly ultrasound these and relatively easily. Um, for smaller creatures with heart issues, um, this is um, a guinea pig with heart disease, these become increasingly more difficult and the images become increasingly more uh, problematic um, to interpret. Um, but we can look at length um, and we can look at width of these um, uh, uh, hearts um, and there are published values uh, for uh, guinea pig hearts anyway. Um, and this one is, is actually hypertrophic. So we've actually got thickening of the wall. We've got a relatively small ventricular lumen in this particular case. This is in cross sections. So this is the heart base level. This particular one shouldn't be in there. I apologize. That's an adrenal image from the ferret from before. So ignore that one. Don't know why that one's in there. These two are the heart images. Um, this one here is in cross section at the heart base. Um, and we're looking at uh, the valve in here um, and a thickening of the heart wall itself. Um, so... Uh, uh, it is possible, but difficult to get an image. For larger rodents, things like beavers, um, easier, much easier to get uh, normal images. But some of these guys have really peculiar anatomy. And the reason I put this one up here is you need to know the, your rodent anatomy. For the small mammals, the heart anatomy is fairly straightforward. Uh, but when we, small pet ones, but when we start to get into things like nutria, coipu, um, beavers, so you start to get into the more exotic ones, they actually have a divided right atrium. So they actually have a, an additional flap sitting there in the right atrium. They all have cardiac murmurs, uh, which is perfectly normal uh, because they have a low blood pressure system uh, and they have this additional um, uh, division of the right atrium that creates the turbulent flow because they've got a low blood pressure system. They need that addition, uh, additional uh, 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 area within the right atrium to stop blood being sucked back out of the heart again because of the low blood pressure uh, circulation that they have. So just, just be aware. Um, we can see cystic ovarian disease in smaller rodents. This one is, this, this is the guinea pig, uh, again for uh, contrast. But this one over here is a cystic ovary in a hamster. Um, so this is in a little Syrian hamster. We've got one large ovarian cyst in here, one slightly smaller one over here. So again, it is possible um, to get uh, an idea uh, of... Uh, ovarian disease using ultrasound. And then finally for other modalities, um, MRI certainly very useful obviously for looking at soft tissue, um, not so useful for looking at uh, bone, uh, but in this particular case we've got a bunny that has a, a retrobulbar uh, abscess, so we've got a, a, a longitudinal mid-sagittal section in here uh, where we can see obviously brain cavity in here, uh, some of the soft tissues associated with the ethmoid turbinates, uh, the tongue itself, uh, pharynx coming down into the neck muscles here. Um, and we can just see the outline and you can see, because obviously this is reversed, you can see the apical bud, which is soft tissue, shows up really dense on MRI. Apical buds up here. We're obviously taking a mid, um, slightly off mid sagittal view here. Um, and so we're not getting the cheek teeth in this particular one. Um, in the coronal view here, this is taken through the head, so these are the ears at the back here, 
Um, so we can see um, the middle ears in this particular case. This one's a relatively okay, although we've got increased um, uh, soft tissue uh, densities on this left side, which might be the start of a, uh, a low-grade uh, ear disease. Um, but we can see on this left side here that there is significant soft tissue infilling and distortion of the globe in, in relation to the right side um, associated with a retrobulbar abscess from a tooth root. So what we're looking at here is actually uh, pus and infection that's pushing uh, the orbit of the eye a little bit out. And if we look here um, in um, the uh, uh, sagittal slice, these are the jaws and the teeth. These come out obviously lucent. We can see the apical buds down the bottom comes out slightly uh, denser. These are the masseters on the sides here, tongue in here, ethmoids in here, eyes here. Um, and again, we can see um, this increased um, soft tissue swelling on this side, which is actually pushing the eye out um, and is also causing um, uh, pocketing uh, of gas in these areas as well. So we can actually see the distortion on that side pushing the eye uh, out associated with a tooth root infection uh, with that tooth uh, there. So this was the third um, uh, molar. CT scanning, which if any of you sending get your clients are wishing to yeah get your pets referred for, for CT scanning, it's becoming becoming cheaper and so uh, more doable. Um, and again, obviously different modality. This is obviously radiography effectively in fine multiple sliced form, but again can be useful uh, for obviously looking at dental disease in particular. Um, so again, we've got rabbits with dental disease here. Uh, and we can see in these different slices going back through the head of the bunny. So starting at the front, going progressively back, and then back towards the eye on that bunny there in particular. We can see uh, on this side, protrusion of the eye itself, but actually we can also see gas pocketing. So this is gas that's actually filled up behind this, because remember this is a radiographic image now, um, and increased soft tissue uh, densities um, associated with the area caudal. So that's the last root there and we've just then gone back beyond it and we can actually then see um, that beyond the caudal root of the third molar we've actually got an abscess which would be typically what we associate with a retrobulbar abscess it's usually that last cheek tooth that can cause it uh, obviously we can then uh, extrapolate so if you're you're doing stuff with species that maybe there isn't a lot of data on uh, ct scanning does give you the ability to then uh, mess around with the uh, the images to create a three-dimensional model and if you're talking about trying to understand anatomy or to fix fractures and things of that nature then it's uh, quite useful. This is a Eurasian beaver um, that we've done some 3D modeling on using CT scanning. Um, gives you a really good idea uh, when you're looking at uh, orthopedic problems. Um, I mentioned a little bit on endoscopy and um, Romain will talk more about this in his surgical uh, um, uh, unit. Um, but obviously imaging modality, it's a useful one. We do use it quite a lot in small mammals. Um, uh, it is, depends upon the user as to how favored it is. I must confess, in a lot of cases, uh, tend to find it easier just to open the animal up rather than putting an endoscope in. Um, you're talking about insufflating, obviously, usually the abdomen with carbon dioxide, but actually if all you've got is a rigid endoscope um, and uh, no ability um, to insufflate, um, so you may be, you know, used to doing birds, which obviously don't require carbon dioxide. You can uh, um, put a, a rigid scope in and put a couple of stay sutures around that into the body wall. And most of these small mammals have relatively flexible ab abdomens. So if you put a couple of stay sutures in, you can actually pull the abdomen up, pull the body wall up. Um, which will suck a bit of room air in, but that's okay. It's no different from doing an ex-lap. Uh, That'll give you the room to then manoeuvre your rigid scope around the inside. So actually, if you want to do minimally invasive and don't have a stack system to pump carbon dioxide with all the complicated port stuff, um, you can do it using a fairly basic rigid four millimeter endoscope um, and putting a couple of stay sutures in the body wall and pulling the body wall up uh, to actually create the room. This is actually an ovarian, um, cystic ovarian uh, stump in a uh, domestic ferret 
um, uh, that was associated. We thought this was an adrenal disease uh, case because it was a spayed female ferret. It turned out actually part of the ovary had been left in and it was actually cystic ovarian disease that was causing uh, the hormone signs. So, um, yeah. <laughs> just to confuse things. Um, but other issues that you may well see, um, so this is a, a, a rabbit with a particularly unpleasant um, cholecystitis. Um, you do sometimes get this in bunnies. Cholecystitis is reported in domestic rabbits. We've got quite a nasty looking lipidotic um, uh, liver in that particular case as well, but a really unpleasant looking uh, gallbladder. Um, and then in this particular case here, uh, we've got another uh, ectopic cyst. Uh, this is in a, uh, a guinea pig uh, associated with cystic ovarian disease. Um, we mentioned yesterday that you can direct intubate. You can obviously use endoscopes um, to either insert into your ET tube and therefore use that to as your guide wire effectively. So put your ET tube over the endoscope and then insert it straight in. This is obviously dependent on having an animal that's big enough um, to uh, take an ET tube of that size because if you've got a standard 2.7 millimeter um, uh, scope then obviously that's going to be a three millimeter tube um, so that's going to limit the size of rodent or, or rabbit that you're going to be able to insert that into unless you have a fiber scope, um, but these are becoming slightly cheaper and you may be able to use that. Alternatively, you can obviously use the endoscope. So this is a guinea pig. Uh, and what we're doing is that's the palatal ostium that we've got in here. We're using the guide wire. Um, this is what this thing is, is going in. And I'm just guiding it in using the endoscope because it makes life slightly easier. So I'm putting the endoscope in alongside it, putting the guide wire in. I'm then gonna take the endoscope out making sure I hold securely where the guide wire is and then going to slot the ET tube over the top of that and, and use that to, to then intubate uh, the guinea pig. So again, you could use that particular modality to make life slightly easier for you uh, for intubation. I think what we'll do is we'll take a break there before looking at birds. Um, so we'll do birds and reptiles and then we'll um, look at other uh, species, uh, principally mammals, other wild animals. Are there any questions on that little lot? Obviously within the units that you that um, you do on the specific species we'll obviously go over again um, uh, more uh, specific cases associated with uh, radiographic images but uh, it just gives you a bit of an idea uh, of the things that you can do with some of these guys. Right, have some caffeine. Um, and we will be back in 15 minutes.